We have been in the series, The Gospel Matters, and, and this is about the matters of the gospel. And not just on Sunday morning, not just hearing things differently, but actually how it impacts our lives day to day, how the message of Jesus makes a difference every day. And last week, we embarked on this topic of law and grace, and we saw last week that legalism is much more subtle than those overt, obvious things that we think about. I mean, there, there's the obvious things out there, things like don't smoke, don't drink, don't go to the, those kinds of movies, things like that. And that that's not necessarily the only measure for legalism. Um, I hope coming to Grace Life long enough, that's not necessarily a struggle for us. But we saw that legalism actually is encoded, embedded in the fabric of this world system. It's, it's, a, it's a doing of the world, but it's also a belief system. And we see that it started back in the garden. So the, the law, this legalistic way of living, performing for acceptance, didn't start with Moses. It started with Adam. It's a, it's a, it's a belief system. And it, it works its way into so many unintended thinking patterns that we have. Where we may say, I, I, I'm not a legalist, I don't struggle with that. And yet, when we see what it really entails, it entails something much deeper than just things that we do. It actually includes how we think. So, so let me give you an idea. If you've ever felt guilty about praying for something, asking God for something, asking God to do something on your behalf without having been to church recently, that's a sign of it. You remember last week we talked about we talked about the idea of GDD, grace deficit disorder. This is a struggle. This is not just a struggle in the world. Yes, the world has a struggle with grace. But unfortunately, the church does too. The church's struggle with grace might be even more detrimental. Because if you can't find it where it's supposed to be, then where do you find it at all? So if you've ever felt guilty about praying for something, asking God for something without having been to church recently, you may struggle with GDD. If you've ever felt guilty about buying another new pair of shoes when you haven't given 10% to the church, if your Amazon bill is more than your tax receipt from the church, if you've ever felt guilty about that, you may struggle with GDD. If you can't get past the shame and guilt of things you've done in the past, I know that that's a, that's a backdoor idea. That, like, that seems, what do you mean if I struggle with shame and guilt that I might be struggling with grace? Certainly. For we set a higher standard of where freedom is and where forgiveness is than the blood of Jesus. If you've ever felt like God wouldn't bless you until you read more or give more or do more, then you probably struggle with Grace deficit disorder. And again, I stole that phrase from a guy named Bill Giovanetti, and it, it, it hit me as I look at my own life. And I believe what we're talking about when we talk about freedom from the law and entering into grace. I believe it with all my heart. It's changed my life. It's changed my, my heart. It's changed the ministry. It's changed everything. I, I said last week, I'm so grateful to have been a part of a fellowship where I could be mentored and taught for so many years where this was the intentional driving truth and message and the reason that Grace Life exists. And yet it can still be a struggle. We saw last week that the reason for the law is something supernatural, something counterintuitive. That God did not give the law to end sin. Think about that for a second. When you make a law in your home, you do it to curb the behavior that's happening in your home. Right? I, I would ask you later, as a dynamic, I would just take a temperature of that and ask you how well that's worked for you. Especially when they become teenagers. But when God gave a law, he gave it for a very different reason. He didn't give it to curb behavior. He gave it to expose behavior. And we saw in Romans chapter 5, it says that he added the law so that the transgression not would decrease, but would increase. We saw that God's not afraid of doing that. He's so secure in what he knows and who he is that he can even allow sin to have its fullest reign so that we could see it for what it obviously is. Because sin had gone covert. 
Sin had gone underground. This is the whole point of the conversation in Genesis chapter 4 when God tells Cain, if your countenance is lifted, will, will that not be good? If you do good, won't your countenance be lifted? But if you don't, won't it be down? And he told Cain this very important idea. He said, sin is crouching at your door. He personified this thing called sin. And he says, he animated it. And he said, it's crouching at your door. And you must overcome it. It seeks to devour you. Sin went rogue. And God, in his heart for people, for lost people, whom he loves desperately, decided with the nation of Israel, giving the law to Moses, that he would put a mirror to expose sin for what it really is. That it would stop being justifiable. It would stop being hidden from. It would stop being denied. It would be so overt. It would be so in our face that we could do nothing but admit its horror and run to a Savior. And yet, even in the church, I see that we have taken this problem, this issue. The, the, the enemy is sin, and yet many times we get confused. If, if you want to know how underground and how deceptive sin is, consider this idea, that even when it comes to our struggle against sin, we almost can't separate it against a struggle with ourselves or God's struggle with ourselves. Phrases like this, I need to come to an end of myself. If, I'm not knocking the language. I'm not knocking the idea. We know what that means. But if you're a believer, the goal of the Christian life is not to come to an end of yourself. God is not waiting to work on your behalf when you come to an end. In fact, the glory of the New Testament is that God puts you in him so that you would be right in his way as he lives his life through you. You are not his obstacle. You are his instrument. And yet many times in Christianity, we think it's so righteous, so pious, so humble to say that we are the problem. I need to come to an end of myself. If you've ever used a phrase like we need to die to ourselves, you've heard that. It's so popular in Christian circles. And that's proof that sin has gone rogue and underground and it's become so deceptive we can't even recognize it. We can't even separate it from ourselves anymore. I need to deny myself as though self is the ultimate problem in the Christian life. And then we saw in week one with this idea of justification that you have been given a brand new self. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. You are no longer identified with sin as a sinner. You are identified with Jesus as a saint. This is the glory of the new covenant. But sin is deceptive. I'll refresh you back to Romans. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Sin has a desire. Don't let it reign that you would obey its lust. The lust of sin is to deceive you into thinking that you're the problem. This, this verse comes after a, whole, a half a chapter where Paul is describing that we have been crucified with Christ. We have been buried with Christ, and we have been raised to newness of life. And then he says, if anybody has died, they are freed from sin. You're released from it. You no longer are obligated to sin. You are not related to it anymore. And the first command of Romans is verse 11, right before this, where it says, even so, in the same way, just like that, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God. And therefore, do not let sin reign in your body. Do not let it pull you. Do not let it deceive you into thinking that you're the problem. Not anymore. Sin is the problem. But it puts a mask on and it covers itself and it, and it, it heinously slithers within our thinking patterns to make us believe we're the issue, we're the problem. And no wonder religion, no wonder Christianity becomes all about us and, and sin management and how we try to do better and become better in order to be better in the eyes of God and people. It's a deception. If we talk about coming to an end of ourselves, if we talk about dying to self, denying self, self is the problem, just replace self there with sin if you're a new creation. Sin is the problem. We're dead to sin. Deny sin. 
Come to an end of sin, yes. People ask me all the time, so if this is all true, then what do I do with sin? Just stop. Just stop. Consider yourself dead to it, because that's the truth. We saw that the law is a mirror to show what we are like. I love that. God gave Israel a law that he wrote with his own finger, it says, on tablets of stone so that they would stop guessing and they would see in print what the problem was. The problem with Israel is they took that law and rather than seeing what the problem was, they used it as a target of what they should do. We're going to see later that the law was never given to show people what they could do. It was a mirror to show their defects. When God gave the law, he wanted to show the defect of what sin had done in humanity. And when God wanted to correct the problem, he didn't use the law. We're going to see that later as well. When God wanted to correct the problem, he didn't send a code or a book or commandments. He sent a son. He sent Jesus that Hebrew says is the exact representation of who he is. Jesus is just like God because Jesus is God. And when he wanted to show you what he was like, he sent his son. And today we're going to see the result of the law and the release from the law. Because the ultimate idea that the book of Galatians in, entails is, comes to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And it says, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. This is what we're after because this is our birthright. That we walk with God, not in the bounds of legalism, but in the freedom of grace. In the reality of the love that he has for us. And then I can hear those thoughts that churn in people's minds because I have them myself. When we talk about this kind of freedom, it's, it's kind of like a fish out of water. What do we do with it? If you've ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, when he finally gets his freedom, he doesn't know what to do with it. It scares him. But can I just encourage you, there's no greater draw, there's no greater guide, there's no greater banks for you to walk on and in and through than love. So many of us have the faulty notion that if we take out the law, then we will run amok with what we really want to do. And I hope you are encouraged when you hear the truth of the gospel, the gospel that matters, the gospel that impacts us day to day, that you have been changed from the inside by grace. And what you really want has been changed into what God really desires for you. And that is the greater guide. That is what will lead us into the freedom which with Christ died for us. So pray with me as we continue to see this result and this release from the law. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth that sets us free. It was for this freedom that you died. Father, your death is not wasted because we struggle. Your death is not wasted because we, we don't get it all the time. Your death is not wasted because we are learning and growing. So in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our misunderstanding, in the midst of our learning and growing, we thank you. We thank you that... It is for our freedom that you offered your life. That we would never return to a yoke of slavery. This legalism, this law, this living by a set of ethics and codes and commands, living by a set of expectations and rules, living by a set of, of standards that are impossible to meet. And when we see the gospel, what a crazy idea that those who could never meet the standard have been gifted what fulfills it because your son met the standard and we simply receive it by grace so that we can bask in the finished work instead of struggling through our unfinished work. We trust you for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So today we want to look at the result of the law and the release from the law. So what's the result of the law? Well, first of all, Romans chapter 7, verse 11 says that the, the law 
gives opportunity to sin. Sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the result of the law is our death. Sin, taking opportunity through the commandment. Without the commandment, there, there would be no opportunity for sin. Sin would still be alive. Sin was still working. Sin still causes death. But it's not given an opportunity without the command. I told you last week, I had some striped socks on. I said, don't look at my socks. And what did you do? You looked at my socks, right? Wet paint, don't touch. Why do we struggle with that? Because we want to get our fingers wet with paint? No, because there's something inside of us that is stirred up as soon as a command comes. This is, this is nothing new. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin. Look at that passage. And the power of sin is the law. Now, now, don't make a leap here. Don't make a leap that the Bible doesn't make for us. Don't, don't make this, well, the law is the problem. The law is not the problem. The law is holy, perfect, and good. Sin is the problem. Sin taking opportunity through the commandment. The commandment was designed to give sin an opportunity. Do you see the point? God wanted sin to have its fullest opportunity so that we would stop being self-deceived by it. Religion is in its heart simply a self-justification for sin that's all it is that if i can do enough be enough read enough if i can be good enough then i am all it is is a self-made effort towards getting right with god it's the essence of sin the law gives sin an opportunity the law gives sin power and then we see second corinthians chapter 3 verse 6 through through nine, it's powerful how it describes the law. Look what it says. God also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, so not of the law. We are adequate as servants of a new covenant, but of the spirit, for the letter kills. Man, that's as blunt as it can be. The letter kills. It doesn't give life, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death There it is, the ministry of death. That's the description of the law. In letters engraved on stones came with glory, because they were given by God, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation, that's the law, has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. I just want to ask you, do you want to be about the ministry of death and condemnation? Is that what you want to be on your life like motto? Or do you want the ministry of righteousness? Ministry of death and condemnation, that's a description of what the law serves. That's all it will do. That's all it was made to do. It it leaves us with a sin consciousness. It was supposed to do that. It leaves us in condemnation. It leaves us in this religious effort of always trying to improve ourselves, trying to be better, continually trying to work on ourselves rather than walk with our Savior. It's the essence of religion. But the law was powerless to change us. It could just expose us. That's what it says in Romans 8, verse 4. It says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. I love that. What the law could not do, it couldn't change you. It could put a mirror against you. It could show you all your defects. It was like that that hotel mirror that magnifies everything. It showed you every pore on your face. It showed you every gray hair. It showed you boogers in your nose. It showed you everything that was wrong with you. It was supposed to do that. And and it's not like a normal mirror, a compact mirror, where you got to squint to really see it. It's magnifying it. So those things that you didn't even know, it was going to expose that. You're not going to get away with anything with the law. That's what it was supposed to do. But it could never, never make you perfect. Look at that Hebrews passage. For the law, since it is only a shadow of the good things to come and not, 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 not. I love that. Not the form of things. It's a shadow. It's a, it's a smoke screen. And, and we've used it as a target. It's a smoke screen. It can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, look at that phrase, make perfect those who draw near. The law, no matter how well you ad- 
appeal to it, no matter how well you adhere to it. It will never make you perfect. Do you see the gospel that matters? That it is Jesus that makes you perfect? That it is faith in him that changes who you are? And that you never again have to look to the law? It can't do anything for you. It's done what it was supposed to do. It made you realize, I need Jesus. The law did not condone sin, but it also could not condemn it. God had to do that. Think about that. The law could not condone sin, but neither could it condemn it. And we needed sin condemned. We needed a punishment, a sentence of death over sin, so that we could live in righteousness. And the law could never do that. Only God could do that. It kept sin from being concealed, but it did not condemn it. The law could never make you perfect. It could expose your imperfections, but not do anything about it. The law cannot save you. And, and maybe if you're convinced of that, can you be convinced that the law cannot help you? The law cannot encourage you. The law will not grow you up. So many Christians believe that having come to Jesus by grace through faith, they now live by law in this expectant manner with God that if I do the right things, then I grow in maturity with him. Christian maturity has nothing to do with what you do. It, it, now, it's going to be in it's going to express through what you do, but it's not based on what you do. Christian maturity happens the same way Christian life happens. Colossians 2.6 says, just as you received him, so walk in him. How did you receive him? By grace through faith. How do you walk in him? By grace through faith. And it goes on to say in that passage in Colossians, and you will be established and rooted in him. You'll be, a, you'll be planted firmly right into Jesus by grace through faith. So the law cannot save you, it cannot encourage you, it cannot help you, it cannot grow you. Because the law does not show what you can do, it shows what you can never do. The law never shows you what you can do, the law shows you what you could never do. They learn this in Matthew 22, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, what must we do to do the works of the law? Give us the greatest commandments. Do you remember that? Actually, they said, give us the greatest command. Basically, take, take the law and the prophets. It's a lot of writing. And give us the Cliff Notes version, right? Do I have to go through Exodus and Leviticus? Do I have to go through all these minor and major prophets and do all the... Can, Jesus, can, just tell me, what's the greatest command? Do you remember Jesus' answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says the second is like it. They didn't ask for two. They asked for one. But Jesus knows humanity, that you can get away with fooling people to thinking you're honoring and loving God. But the proof of the honoring and loving God is not how you love God, but how you love people. So he says the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now I want you to consider that. If the law does not show you what you can do, Jesus wasn't telling them what they could do. He was really showing them what they could never do. You know, you could never love God like this. You and your own strength and your own power and your own humanity, you couldn't do that. There's going to have to be a love infused into you that is unconditional, that puts others first, that is sacrificial, that is selfless. There's going to have to be a love infused into you that is not based on what comes back to you. There's going to have to be a love placed into you that is called agape. And until then, you could never love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You could, you could never even love your neighbor as yourself. That's the glory of the gospel. This love was infused into us. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. Do you see that any viable, true love that we have for God or people is predicated, is based, is founded in that God loves us. You can't give what you don't have, and you won't give what you don't know you have. So the law never tells people what they can do. It just shows them what they can't do. Drives us to the end of self-righteousness, of the lie that we shall be like God based on what we do rather than his doing. It brings us to the recognition that my, one of my Bible teachers in, in Bible school used to say, her name was Bonnie Thomas, um, wife of Chris Thomas, daughter of Major, son of Major Ian Thomas. Bonnie would always say, 
I can't, but God can. I can't, and God never said I could, but he can, and he always said he would. It's, it's God that is loving in and through you because he loves you, and it loves to overflowing. And we live now by a dynamic that has nothing to do with a set of standards. It has everything to do with an infused life into us. And it's not based on feelings. It's a fact. You've got Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, because of him, because of that love, yes, with God all things are possible. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Loving your neighbor, a new commandment, Jesus says, not like the old, not love your neighbor as yourself, not give to them what you give to yourself, but actually, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you give to them what I gave to you. This is the dynamic of Christian community. This is the dynamic of, of lifing out the love and the life that's been placed in us so that a world at large that so desperately needs to see Jesus in action only has to look at his children, the church, to see it happening. If we believe the truth of living in a gospel that matters, it's under grace and not law. We run to Jesus for this. And I want to look at the release from the law. I, I, I believe that in the New Testament, if we are looking for doctrinal truth in terms of some of the things that we talk about in the new covenant, the, this freedom from the law is probably the most explicitly expressed one. Like the fact that the church holds on to law, the fact that we still struggle with legalism in the terms of believing that God actually came to live inside of us so that we could then fulfill the law. I hear that all the time. Well, God put the Holy Spirit in the believer so the Holy Spirit can now then live according to the law. There's nothing more hogwashy than that but maybe that word. That's crazy. God didn't give you the Holy Spirit so you could fulfill the law. It's too late. Jesus fulfilled the law. God gave you the Holy Spirit so that you would be about the dynamic of life, not law. Look at Romans 7, 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made. I like that. You were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be Joined to another, joined to Jesus, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. How many believers think that by following the law, they bear fruit for God? But actually, this passage tells you just the opposite. By following the law, all you can do is express death. If you want to bear fruit for God, know that you're joined to Jesus. We saw last week that, we, that the law wasn't made for the righteous man, 1 Timothy 1.8. We see here in this passage, we see here, we weren't made for the law. We were made to die to it so that we could be joined to Jesus. You were created to be in a relationship with Jesus. That's it. That's not just a, a, a blessing to the church. That's actually, that's actually the desire of God for the whole world. He created us to be in right relationship with himself. Not to be rightly related to commands. We're dead to the law. Notice it says we're dead to it. It didn't say it died, right? We died to it. Maybe even more clear, look at Romans chapter 10 verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. My question is, do you believe in Jesus? If you say yes, then guess what? Christ is the end of the law for you. Stop living under those expectations as though God has got some daily planner where he has all these expectations of your life in that planner and he's checking a box every time you fulfill one. Oh, there's Johnny. He, he prayed today. Let's check that one off. Oh, he went to church. Let's check that. Oh, he went again. Let's check that off. It's ridiculous. We do that. God's not doing that. He's not measuring you like that. Christ is the end of the law. How much clearer can this be? He's the end of it. He's not the beginning of how you fulfill it. He's not the beginning of how you then uh, achieve it. The moment Jesus came into your life, the dynamic of living by the law, not just the Mosaic 10 or 613, that law that started in the garden, this system of believing 
knowing the difference from right and wrong would be a lifeline to us. God said, don't eat of that. Don't buy into that. The moment Jesus came in, that ended. Look at Galatians 3. But before faith came, so before we were believers, we were kept in custody under the law. It handcuffed us, being shut up to the faith that which was later to be revealed. Therefore, therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. It, it's like, it, like the law is going, do you want to keep living by me? Do you, do you still, still want to live in self-condemnation and defeat and frustration and death? Is this the ministry you want? And if not, let me tutor you. Let me lead you to something better. Let me lead you to Jesus. So that we may be justified by faith. For no flesh will be justified by the law. I don't care how good you are. I don't, Paul was the best law keeper there was. And he says when he met Jesus, it all became rubbish, dung to him. He counted his loss because it matters not. Nothing he achieved mattered anything. And he was the best of the best when it came to law keeping. The law has become a tutor and now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. So we are dead to the law. Christ is the end of the law. And now that, the law has, now that faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor of the law. It can't be more clear in Scripture that we don't live by law. That you don't need to feel guilty if you buy a new pair of shoes today and don't give to the church today. You don't need to feel guilty about that. That, that God isn't motivating us through guilt and performance, or through fear and shame and condemnation. God's motivation comes from a new heart and love. And I fully believe this with all my heart, that you don't have to, you don't have to bow, browbeat a congregation into being who God says for them to be. Just teach them who he says and let them be. Is that a Beatles song? Let it, let it be. This is what it means to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, to not be conformed to the pattern of this world. God is not about achieving to receive, but he's about receiving to achieve. He's not about performance-based acceptance, but an acceptance-based performance. And when we see that, when we see that, that God doesn't live with us that way, then not only do we see that we have been released from the law, then we can see where this impacts us daily in our daily relationships and we can release others from our law. For releasing others is really the proof. It's really the proof of whether we get law and grace. And this is going to be meddling, at least for me. I did not have to go into a lot of research for this part. I just had to be honest with myself. I had to be honest with the truth. As we look at this, in order to release others, I, I want to encourage you, Jesus did not remove or disobey the law. He fulfilled it. Why is that important? Because the law had a demand, and it needed to be fulfilled. So when Jesus fulfilled it, we see that in Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish. I came to fulfill. That's important. Jesus didn't disobey the law. He didn't break the law. He fulfilled it. Meaning it's satisfied. It's done. It's done. You don't have to fulfill. That's why, that's why I said earlier, God didn't put the Holy Spirit in you so that you could fulfill the law. You think you're going to add to what Jesus did? You think you can do it better than Jesus? He already did that. He didn't abolish it because it still is out there. But it's for the unbeliever so that they could tutor them to Jesus. I've often illustrated the law as kind of like, because we can get in, in, in grace circles, we can get the idea that the law is a problem. The law is not a problem. It's holy, perfect, and good. It's like rain. It's like rain. Rain is good when it's on the outside, but when it starts trickling into your home and gets on the inside, it's a problem because it's not designed to be there. If you got a leak, get under grace, the grace umbrella. That's corny. Do you think that Jesus 
accomplish what he set out to do? Did he fulfill his mission? Because if he did, then the law is fulfilled. It's no longer our goal. It's no longer our target. And our acceptance is no longer tied to that. Our value and worth and our belonging and our performance are no longer tied to how well we adhere to the law. It's now tied to Jesus. And we can release others because we have been released. We can release others because we are so, so eternally secure in him now. We, we don't have to control people. We don't have to manipulate people. We don't have to defend and protect ourselves all the time as though your opinion of me is what matters most, so I need to uphold that to the uttermost. My security is in him. We don't have to hide and pretend and pose. We can agree to disagree. Boy, if we could just get that as a community, we can agree to disagree without tying everybody's worth to it, without, without being wrapped up into some agenda. And this works both ways. We begin to live from desire and not expectations. And this is a tough one. It, it's, it's hard to make that shift because I know that when we talk about expectations, we are typically talking about things we deeply desire. But then we attach a method onto it. See, a desire is a desire. An expectation is the accomplishing of that desire through some method. So I desire Catherine to communicate with me. I desire that. It's, it's in my heart for that. I love her. She loves me. And I desire that she communicates with me. But she's often distracted by kids and life and other things. And I'm just using an illustration here. She's right over there, so I don't want to get in trouble. And, and, and HGTV. And, and so when I desire her to communicate with me, there's nothing wrong with that. But if I expect that she should then do you realize, not for her, but for me, it will never go well. Because if she then, because of my expectation, she communicates with me, all I've gotten is paid off. My expectation was met. But I'm not content with a desire. Because I've lived so much on this idea that my desires need to turn into expectations. That's the control of our desires. Release that. I would love for her to communicate with me. And I'm finding after 25 years of marriage that if I live from desire and actually just communicate with her, guess what comes back? Communication to me. I've learned that if I give what I have, she gives what she's got. But if I keep pointing the finger of expectation, I continually get disappointed. I continually get hurt. I continually get angry. I continually get frustrated. And then I employ this method. This is all legalism in its most subtle forms with grace deficit disorder. Some of the signs of living by the law. Like I said, I didn't have to do a lot of research here. Just be honest. If we can't admit when we're wrong. If we think that admitting that we made a mistake is going to somehow diminish our value or our worth in somebody's eyes or what they think about us. If I can't admit that I've made a mistake, I'm, I'm suffering from a grace deficit disorder. I told Catherine one time, I, I want you to embrace your mistakes. So she hugged I just always have to be perfect or better than somebody else. I, I'm not saying this for you to then indict yourself. I'm not saying this for you to self-examine. I'm not saying it for any of that. I'm telling you in my list of things that I could struggle with when I believe grace fully and I believe everything that we're talking about and in my learning curve and in my growth process, I can still, I'm still dealing with some of these things. Uh, this isn't to be condemnation. This is to be revelation through an observation. Perfectionism is a sign of legalism. I, I never expected my two-year-olds to be perfect. You know how I know that? You, you know the, the, the single greatest proof that I knew that they were going to mess things up? We put them in diapers. We expected nothing less for them to mess everything up. We didn't expect them to be potty trained at two or whatever. We, we, we expected their mess ups. This is, diaper is a sign of grace. I get it. 
You're not going to, at this age, at this maturity level, you're going to make a mess of things right in your pants. And I'm going to wrap you in grace. What if God is thinking like that with us? Are you hard on, hard on yourself? Do you beat yourself up? Do you struggle with self-condemnation? These are signs of legalism of a standard that you have set in order to be okay with yourself differently than the standard God has set, Jesus, who's already okay with you. You never feel like you measure up, you compare to others. Do envy and jealousy have their way with you? You always feel like you're getting the raw end of the deal, play the victim. These are all subtle signs of legalism. I mean, playing the victim is the idea that... that, Either I don't deserve this or this doesn't happen to others. I'm comparing and competing. Somewhere in there, it, it's, a, it's a show that I, I really don't get that this, this life of grace cannot be accounted for by merit, cannot be accounted for by, by what I do. Do you hold grudges? Are you critical? Are you never content? So I gave you some of my list. But I'm not beating myself up with it. These actually become a reminder, an escort for me to change my mind, to repent, to think differently. That when I feel these things, when I think these things, I've got a better way offered to me. I've got a way that's not death. I've got a way that's not condemnation. I've got a way that's life in the spirit. And without denying any of these, but actually applying that I have thought these, I can run to Jesus and be reminded of the truth. That from the beginning, God said, don't eat from this. Don't buy into it. Don't believe it. You now have been given the bread of life. You are free from all those demands and condemnations. And I don't mean of daily, I don't, I don't mean the demands of daily living. We have those. I mean those demands that would seek to define you and measure you and defeat you and tell you you will never be okay, that you'll never be enough, that you'll never cut it, that you'll never measure up, you'll never be as good as so and so, or that you'll always just be, <laughs> you'll always just be good enough to stay a little behind. Jesus has something to say about that to you. He put an end to it. He put an end to your self-evaluating ways. He put an end to it. The evaluating of our value based on works and behavior and achievements and feelings and possessions and opinions and circumstances. He proves your worth through a once and final act where he declared it is finished. It is finished. You no longer have to live under the tyranny of the law. And the standard, the measuring stick, is not your life. It's his. Isn't that beautiful? It's his life. That's the standard. That's the measuring. That's why I said last week that oftentimes we feel like if we let go of the law, it will lighten or lessen or diminish our standard of living. No, it won't. No. Grace is a greater, higher standard that's already been gifted to you than any standard you couldn't even achieve. So in closing, and as a teaser for next week as we talk about the reason, the result, and the release of grace, I'll remind you of Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not be master of you. It will not own you. It will not, it will not master you any longer for you are not under law but under grace. God is not measuring you. He's treasuring you. He's not measuring you. He's treasuring you. Don't buy the religious lies. Stop looking through the lens of the law and start looking through the glasses of grace and you will experience the freedom that he came to die for. Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. That we no longer live under law. We are set free from it. We are dead to it. Christ is the end of it. And we can live in the beauty and the freedom 
And yes, sometimes even the unknown of grace. But there we see that we are valued. We are loved. We are secured forever. And Father, now we can give that to others. And that's what this world so desperately needs. They need to see a church alive in grace. Thank you for the truth that sets us free in your name. Amen.